In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hi, this is Materialized, the Launch Tabletop podcast, where we talk about turning game ideas into tangible objects. Uh, this episode is recorded on the 6th of June, 2023, and it's episode 27. Uh, today we're chatting with artist Jackie Davis. Is it? Oh, I'll have to check later on if it's Davis or Davies. I don't know how you pronounce it. Okay, that's going to be something we'll be asking um, about drawing players into your game world. Hi, so I'm your host, Eris, and this week with me is Kate as my co-host. Hello, Kate. Hello, and I have special guest, Hayley. Hello, <laughs> Hayley, as well. So yeah. we wonder, I wonder if Hayley will make an appearance later on. Um, I'll, I won't ask you how things are, because I'm going to ask you that in a second. Instead, I'm going to introduce Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Did I get your name right, or did I totally butcher it? No, Jackie Davis is right. No, you're good. Ah, uh, beautiful. Because oh, it's one of those things, like, I watch Taskmaster, like, with Greg Davis, but then I noticed that him and Alex Horn pronounce it Davies or da like they both do it differently. And I'm just like, I don't know what the right way to say these names are like anymore. So yeah. Kate, how are you going? What's been happening? Uh, I'm well. It's been quite a week. Mm. So we launched our Kickstarter campaign for Stella last Tuesday night, Australia time, and mm. did not go well. Long story short, we cancelled it over the weekend. So yeah. um, everyone was a bit down over the weekend. So we picked ourselves up, dusting ourselves off, kicking rocks, you know, <laughs> and now, you know, everybody's doing their postmortem survey, which is always very important as much as people might, you know, go about having to fill it in. It's, it's really important for us to do that. Mm. So we've got some lessons to learn and, uh, yeah. We don't know if we will come back to Kickstarter with that particular thing. Yep. It's too early to say, but um, Stella's not going anywhere. No, Stella exists, but if the Kickstarter got to reassess that, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's obviously sad and frustrating, but, hey, like you said, yeah. I think I think one of the things for me as part of the team that's been positive is seeing how the team has kind of come together and is sort of like pulling together. It's not like... Mm tearing us apart if that makes sense like so i think oh, that's totally. positive. Yeah. yeah speaking of kickstarter campaigns that didn't go appallingly badly jackie had a really good one. Oh, I, I, I okay i've done all this preparation and i didn't even know, I about know this, so and just, this is terrible just out the window yeah I have I can <laughs> completely, okay so do i need to look up a link what am i doing what's happening what was the kickstarter it was just for um the uh soul book we kickstarted oh. the um like cover illustrated edition and yeah. Okay, well, I can, I can share the book link, and we'll obviously bring it up uh, in more detail later on. But we have, so this yep. is the the website, which is style book to say s u l book dot com. Um, I will admit, I was reading through this website to get a bit of understanding about, you know, just so I could prepare for the talking to you, Jackie. And it sounds really interesting. I was like, oh, I've got to like, I haven't loaded my Kindle for quite a while, so I need to open it up and like. Um, add the book because um, it does look very interesting and, and I, I enjoy fantasy and stuff, so that's really cool. But, yeah, and I, I thought, okay, okay, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole. I'll go down the rabbit hole for the second. But one of the things that I thought was interesting when I was reading about it was that it started out as a bit of a like a role-playing kind of thing between you and a friend. Is that sort of yeah, like um, a storytelling? Like, yeah. Yeah, between Katie and I, we sort of met on a website called conceptart.org when that was a thing. Okay. And the side of it was like a text-based RP. So basically just a Google Doc and I would post as a character and then she would post as a character and we just okay on and on like that. Um, and and then you've turned it into like this whole like world and like timeline and yeah, amazing. Yeah, we built the whole, you know, sort of loads of stories have happened in the world over the years and we thought oh, it'd be hmm. quite fun to actually share it with people. So let's pick a arc from there and write it up as a um, book and then. So okay. it's... It's so wonderful. We had um Andrew Bosley on um a couple of weeks ago and he's working on a personal project which is like a narrative like you know book thing as well and I just think it's so exciting to see like people who are 
like multidisciplinary mm. artists, I suppose, is the way that like and bringing their skills to kind of, you mm. know, it, it bring forward in different ways and building worlds. Yeah. Really, really cool. You've just been to the UK Games Expo, which I don't think we've talked talk to anyone about on the show before. So that's something that we don't Ooh. really have any experience with. Um, mm. Do you want to just give us maybe like a, like, what is it? What's it about sort of thing? Oh, uh, yeah, it's just sort of, well, I've only been to the UK one at Essen, so it's sort of a little mini Essen in the UK. Um, yeah, people go, there's um, at the NEC in Birmingham, and companies have gone and you know, they display games and um, okay. have a wander around and play test them, et cetera. It uh, is, so like I was looking at this, so the website is ukgamesexpo.co.uk, um, yeah. And I was looking, I had a brief look at it and it, I was a bit surprised to learn that it seems to be pretty much all tabletop games. Like, is there, it's, is it just tabletop games? Or oh, yeah, it... yeah, it's only, um, yeah, tabletop games. Um, yeah, wow. That's cool. Because, like, in Australia here, our biggest, like, gaming convention is PAX Australia, but that's, like, a mix of, like, video board, like, pop culture. Mm. Like, it's kind of like a whole lot of things. And so. Um, but it's still predominantly digital. It's still yeah. very, very heavily digital. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so that was last weekend. Uh, yeah, last weekend it's gone. Yeah. How was it? Yeah, it was good. A friend and I, um, we went up on uh, the Saturday. So mm-hmm. go from Liverpool to uh, Birmingham. Uh, so we were there mostly just for the afternoon. And it was well quite busy, which is good to see because obviously people, you know, getting back into the swing of things. Um, yeah. yeah. So we wandered around, you know, handing out portfolios and meeting people and that yeah. kind of thing. Had you, uh, did you have any appearances or anything like that organized? No, no, it was sort of just a spur of the moment thing because actually it's my yeah. sister's 30th tomorrow and we weren't okay. sure what, day she, what weekend she was going to do her birthday thing on and I didn't want to miss it. So, yeah, happy birthday enough. to your sister all the way from Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. What, what uh, interesting things did you see? There's usually something when I go to a, a, a con, one thing that I'll go, that was fantastic. Uh, um, a game uh, called The Old King's Crown. This guy's um, he's gone and so made his own game uh, in his spare time, and he had a stand. I want to say in Hall Two, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all just for his game. And the art is fantastic. So he's been having to do it because I think he works in the game industry um, okay. mostly. So he's just pitching it to people, and the art is fantastic. And he's done so much of it. Um, what was it called again? Sorry, I was pressing buttons and must confess. The I Old King's Crown. His crown. Okay. I think that was and has he illustrated it himself or he's yeah, he's I think oh, he wow. himself. Yeah, it was so <gasps> really weird. So we spent quite a while just standing looking at all the art. Um I think that's that is coming amazing. Up, I think it's coming up to Kickstarter later this year. So he's Yeah, just, it says coming twenty twenty three. So that's definitely one to keep an eye on. The detail. Is, is this the one? Yeah, that's the one. Oh that wow, that does look detail is astonishing. Yeah. There you go. So who is the person who is doing this? <laughs> uh you'll have to inquiring <laughs> minds need to know. No, I'll click on the board game gig link the link that's on the website and we'll see. Yeah. Pablo Pablo Clark. Yep. It's on the TTS. There's a rule book. There's a Discord. Eerie Idol Games. Pablo yeah. Clark. We were just really impressed with the whole thing, so that yeah. I think that's what Anna is. Um, well, thank you for telling us about it because uh, yeah, yeah the, the, I hadn't didn't had no awareness of awareness of it, so that's it looks stunning, yeah. Mm. Very cool. So that's okay. Sorry. So that was kind of a highlight for you seeing that, then obviously, yeah. Yeah, because sort of, um, I think it's his passion project. So after having done so, so you kind of admire like oh god the amount of time that must have taken to do all the you know this work and all the yeah. effort is really cool yeah wow well thank you that was an unexpected delight to oh, be learn yeah. about that yeah really cool um was there any other little things that stood out for you from the time that you were there um well, did you nice run to... into anyone oh uh, yeah well, well i went to go and say hi to um alley cat games um yeah. They actually handled the shipping for Sal, so we went to go and say thank you for oh, lovely. Wonderful. helping yeah. out. So it's just nice to see people, you know, that you I hadn't seen since COVID. Um, yeah. So we went to say hello to people. I quite enjoyed seeing all the, um, cause they're the little Viking reenactment village outside the NEC. So we oh. saw quite a few Vikings wandering around through the halls. 
Uh, that was fun. Lovely. Wow. Good. All right. So uh, we'll dive into the main interview now. Um, and I'll read out my pre-prepared little introduction about who you are for anyone that uh, has not already Googled you if they, you know, had, didn't know by now. Um, so this is it. Jackie has a flair for expressive characters and a rich sense of light and colour that brings the games she illustrates to life. Her body of lively work includes games such as Cubitus, Cubitus, Ex Libris or Ex Libra, I don't know how you say that, Stockpile, Red Rising, Perlock Holmes, Furiardi, Furiardi's Tale Cow. Man, this is a tongue twister, that one for me, Tale, and many more. Um, and you're also the co-creator of the of Sal, uh, Sul, uh, Sal, Sal, Sal. Yeah. <laughs> which is a uh, a book uh, illustrated um fantasy novel wow D uh yeah so you've done so many work like obviously those games that we listed there like you've on board game geek your uh, credits is quite extensive um yeah very c congratulations obviously for like just doing all the, these amazing yeah. games like that's really yeah. cool i gotta i gotta confess one small thing though when i was looking through the list and i saw perlog Holmes there i messaged some friends of mine um and i was like did we play this game and did I struggle with it? And they were like, "Yeah, you hated it because it's a deduction game." And I'm like, "Terrible at deduction games." And uh, the, but then my but then my friend was like, "But you love the art." And I'm like, "Oh, I thought so." Like, <laughs> so even like well, five years ago, whatever, when I played that, like, <laughs> um, it is a beautiful like it's a it's a fun take on Sherlock Holmes with a cat. Like, it's just so so cool. Um, yeah, but you've done all these other ones and it's really cool. I'm actually going to jump into one of the questions that I had was going to ask later on, but I think it actually makes sense here. A, a number of these games that you've worked on seem to be um, your part, like there's numerous artists who, who are working on them. You're not like it's just because obviously big projects often require more than one kind of person. Do you approach those kind of projects where you're working alongside other artists differently from projects where you're the sole artist? Um, I think it actually depends a lot on the art director, really, because some, some of the big ones, like with Storm Hollow, which I think Dan May was one of the... Um, mm, that was one of Dan. Yeah. Um, you're just always in contact only with the art director, so he assigns everyone work, and you just do you know what you're asked to do, um, versus like a smaller game where, though, if you're working with you and the graphic designer, who also are you know, considered an artist because they do stuff I just can't do... Mm -hmm. um, tend to work a lot closer with them so I think actually the smaller the team you know the closer you'll work together and be in contact and if there's hundreds of you then yeah. you're just always going through the art director yeah okay what so, are your I weapons guess, of choice when you're working what do you what's what's in your arsenal on your on your desk I use a little interest for mm -hmm. well, it's yeah. interest for large um which is like 10 years old now ish I think yeah. um yeah I used to have a big giant Cintiq, you know, which would sit on the desk and you'd draw on. But I figured out actually the um, the intros is more ergonomic. Yeah. But it's been putting me off updating my OS, though, because I think if I update the OS oh. on my computer, I won't be able to use the tablet anymore and I have to get a new one. So I'm too lazy. To That's annoying. That. So what's the um, Intuos 4 like? Because I've got I, I, I actually had an Intuos 4 back in like 2006 or something. Yeah, I've got, got an Intuos Pro. I think I had an Intuos That's... Oh, yeah. yeah cool yeah i had a similar one yeah that's awesome um i although i'm not i'm a my background's graphic design by the way jackie not not actual like making art so but um i one of the things that you mentioned just then though about the cintiq having problems we're going to get in the rabbit hole by the way anyone listening we're going to get very nerdy for a second um when we're talking to andrew he said a similar thing that he actually switched away from the cintiq for a similar reason that he actually found it was kind of getting in the way of him like doing this mm -hmm. stuff Although I think he now uses an iPad for most things. He, he said he's got an Procreate. iPad Pro, and I think yeah. he's using Procreate on that. Yeah, I bought an iPad Pro with the intention of, oh, I'd be able to sit in the garden and paint and stuff, and then figure out, actually, I prefer using my bigger monitor. Mm, yeah. so now the iPad Pro is for, like, podcasts and YouTube. And stuff. Ah, yeah. fair enough. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, but but it's interesting how like I guess people who are using it like day in day out, the some like when if you're not used to it, you would think that having a tablet down on the table and then looking up at a screen, it'd be a weird kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. disconnect because it's not like you know like it is like drawing on paper or whatever. But um, but obviously like it works and you must get used to it because it's what you're preferring yeah. to do. It was that was that like a difficult kind of ch challenge when you first started doing that? Uh, I've always had. Um... 
you know, I think my first drawing tablet was a little like Wacom Velita, which is only about, you know, a tiny oh, thing. I haven't even I heard of that yet. Yeah. I sort of got used to using tablets that sit on your desk and then switched to a Cintiq for a few years because I was like, oh, that's the proper one that you're supposed to, you know, professional <laughs> yeah. use. But actually I found it just made me hunch over and I just didn't like it ergonomically. So I think yeah. last year I found this, the interest for like 30 pounds on Amazon. Oh, so that's we- wonderful. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's another brand that I've seen some artists talking about. I think it might start with an X or something. I, um, oh, they might X. be a Chinese. I think mm. it is with X pen. Is it? Or oh, maybe. Open. Yeah. But I've, I've heard some artists saying that they found that, like, you know, good, but, and I don't know. But I'm, I'm be surprised. As, is Wacom not making tablets or maybe they're just real expensive? Oh, no, they do. For, I've got a. Okay. Well, it's not easy. I had an uh, interest for in. Um, university, so I knew what they were like, mm-hmm. and the pens because they're slightly different pens. I had all the old pens from um, oh. which worked on the Cintiq, and I didn't want to have to get a whole load of new pens and stuff. So I found a tablet whose driver would, you know, work. Um, yeah, moving to the Intuos, the the Pro, mm. um, I had used a four previously. The pen is different, but yeah. the pen for the Intuos Pro is exactly the same as the pen for the Cintiq. Yeah, um, well, so like that, it's helpful. Also an old one. Yeah, um, the new yeah the new Cintiqs and the new Entrosses all use the same stuff, but I had an old Cintiq. Oh, okay, right. Like I think thirty kilograms. Uh, the guy who came with me to the UK Games Expo, I gave him my old Cintiq. Holy dooly! This thing weighs thirty kilograms because of its base. So two of us had to get wow. it into his car and quite a mission. Huh. Wow! You, you can't even work out doing that. Mm. So, so since we're in the weeds for a little bit, I might as well ask you, is there any particular software that you use for doing your art then? Um, I just use uh, Photoshop. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to use Procreate more, but again, I like to, I prefer using my monitor mm. and they only have, you know, Procreate only for the iPad. So mm. if they ever came out with a um, desktop version. I know, think def- the only way around it, and I've not tried it, is you can, with the iPad Pros, the USB-C like connected mm-hmm. ones, you can plug in a monitor like, or have them go convert to a HDMI dongle and then go to like a HDMI monitor. Um, but I have no idea about like latency and stuff. And there are uh, other apps. Like I think there's, or oh, there is definitely an app that's called like a dot Astro pad. I think it's called. There's an Astro pad, I think is, and that lets you like use another monitor and stuff. But I have no idea about the latency and like if it's work, like actually practical or not, but yeah. Well, yeah, no, definitely. The, the other cool thing, like with Photoshop, is like obviously it's got a huge legacy, right? So like you've got a lot of tools to draw on and like muscle memory and all that kind of stuff. So like that's, that's important, I think. Yeah, well, like a few years ago, I tried out um, was it Clip Studio? Downloaded the oh. um, file mm-hmm. of that, and there were just so many menus everywhere, and it wasn't set up the way I'm used to having my Photoshop yeah. set. No, not for me. <laughs> I closed it in like yeah. ten minutes or something. I had exactly a similar thing I gave Clip Studio a go, but then I know artists that like think yeah, it's the bee's right. knees and use it all the time. So, mm. yeah, oh, fascinating. Um, I, one thing I know that, um, and she might have changed, but I remember a few years ago seeing Beth Sobel post like snippets of work, like she'd like practiced, um, she'd do like practice illustrations of like faces and things, and she'd share them to like social media. And I'm pretty certain she was using Photoshop for all of that. And it's just like it's such a capable, like, yeah. Mm system so it's really cool do you ever you know go old school with pencil and paper or watercolors um i painted acrylics uh, just for christmas because um a few of the ball game artists we have a slack chat that we chat to each other yeah and, and yep. we ran a um christmas art exchange oh lovely um, cool. santa thing last year mm. so we, we all had to paint each other an actual in a physical piece of art that we posted. Yeah, so, that's cool. That's yeah. really cool. But it's not something that you do terribly commonly. It's not coming commonly just because I I mean, I have the easel behind me. Um, yeah. I have to set it up in the kitchen and stuff because that's where the best light is. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also just fine work and stuff. It's more practical to yes. um, work in Photoshop and quicker and you can send PSDs, that kind of thing. If you had to edit a real painting, yeah, yeah. that would be a bit more of a faff. Yeah, I, I I've heard that. Um, is it Vincent Durat Durat? How do you say his name? Do you try? 
Detroit. Sorry, I'm terrible with the pronunciation of things. I'm pretty certain. Does he still work, as far as you know, like with like um, physical mm-hmm. media? I think I've seen photos of his work and it's all like pencils, which just amazes me. I love his yeah. stuff. Mm. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. Like Andrew mentioned that he works entirely mm. in, you know, the real world, which yeah. is amazing. But, but I, 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 it is, but, like, I also agree with Jackie. Like, I mean, especially coming from the angle of a graphic designer, like if I can receive mm. a layered file from an artist mm. that I can easily, you know, pull apart to um, insert, you know. Investigate what's going on down the back there. Yeah, yeah. like I feel like that's a very practical thing when you're working on mm. like a commercial product, like a game. So I, I definitely think the digital art is like wonderful for that. Um, mm. Yeah. So I guess it, what, a question that's kind of connected is, um, is there something that you've learned from like working alongside p- publishers or artists um, in the game industry that you found kind of helpful, like maybe a bit of a tip or a trick or some kind of like perspective? Yeah, actually, um, her dad may told me this. Um, ooh, I think working on Skyway Robbery, so back back in 2012-ish. Mm. Um, you thought the values in a painting were a little bit flat. It's like you do know if you have a gradient map set to grayscale that you can click on and off. You can check the values in a painting. So, you know, the black and white hand thing. genius. Really quickly. It's just like, ah, yeah. so I always, now I always have, you know, a um, black and white gradient map on the top of one. I've layers. never thought, yeah, that's amazing. Because I've, I've always done, like, because I've had work where I've worked with artists on, like, game stuff and, yeah, okay, the, some stuff isn't right. So normally I'll then, I'll just spend a lot of time in Photoshop trying to kind of get things how, for me, is the, the graphic designer kind of wants it to, to mm. look. And I'd never even thought of using a great gradient map to help with some of that. That's that's amazing. Yeah, very so that, cool. So that's one I think I still use to this day is just to easily check values. You don't have to save it out or anything. Just go, oh yeah, that's fine then. Yeah. So has art always been something that you have done? Like, if we were to look at little Jackie when she was six, oh, when yeah, yeah. You, with the pencils and the crayons, who was like, I drew yeah. something. Yeah, I've always been drawing stuff. My mum's story is that. I was trying to get her to draw horses and kept on telling her that it was wrong. So then she just stuck through the paper at me and watched you do it yourself. Um, it's so, great. Uh, yeah, I've no, always been drawing and um, took, you know, art for A-levels. I don't know what that is in Australia. Um, yeah, it's like senior. Yeah, that's like, the yeah. same year to be it. Yeah. Yeah. And did you head off to college or university and study art um, at higher levels? I did. Um, it was, I liked it. Uh, animation um at oh, yeah. uh, so study uh, 2d animation cool so and... okay bouncing bouncing off that because obviously yeah. animation has a strong like efficiency like you, you kind of it benefits from being efficient with like um your, your artwork because you're doing a lot of like frames right like keyframes and whatever have you found has that background helped you with working on board games and stuff where maybe you've got limited time or like the size of the cards is like small or, or something like has has any of that I guess background influenced maybe how you approach doing board game art? Uh, I suppose so. Sort of the idea is that you're trying to get the composition as simple as possible so that you know you can do it uh, quickly. So like um, mm-hmm. in doing cards and stuff, I try to keep compositions relatively simple just because. You know, at, at, if you're looking at it at a glance, you have to be able to read it as you're putting it on the table um, mm. rather than having to spend lots of time, you know, studying it to figure out what's going on. Mm. Mm. And you also said that you had a background in concept art because that's how you met um, Katie. It's Katie, isn't it, Katie? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and so I'm guessing concept art is a bit similar as well where it's generally like a not as detailed kind of work and things like that. Mm. Well, um, at uni I discovered that's sort of... Um, I think it's pre biz in animation, you know, all the design work before the movie actually gets made is what mm. I enjoy doing more than the actual animating. Because animating, you need a good sense of timing, yeah. which I wasn't very good at. So I always had to call uh, another friend of mine, Lauren, over and have her sort of figure out where the keyframe should be and stuff. Because, ah. like, oh God, this is just, you know, uh, tough. <laughs> like if I liked doing all the pre biz stuff, so the character design and environment design and that kind of thing. Cool. So were there any interesting projects that you worked on when you were working in that field? Things that we'd go, holy cow, really? Um, well, I went straight into actually board game work um, after uni because yeah. I graduated and then thought, oh, well, I'll just get a few little um, freelance jobs while, you know, I look for a studio job. Yeah. But then it 
board game work took off. So I just never bothered looking for a studio job. So I haven't actually worked in animation. I went straight from. Oh, okay. Well, my, obviously it wasn't too terrible working in board games. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, so have you, um, did, so, okay. This, okay. Were you, did you play board games before you went, got into the industry as an artist or was it something that you've kind of come through, through art rather than as a player? Um, yeah, I came, I've come through it mostly through art, really. So um, mm. I've played a few small ones, like uh, Matt, the guy I went to the UK Game Expo with, made us play a game called, I think it's Zombies in uni, which made me absolutely livid because the idea is you're trying to sort of screw over your um, friends to get to a helipad. Um, so, you know, we played a few games here and there. Uh, Lauren, the girl who was good at um, timing, yeah. uh, we had a half share of the Game of Thrones game. So we each pitched in half to buy this game. Yeah, um, and the idea was we were gonna at the end of uni we played like a long game and the winner got to keep the game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who won? Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, I think Lauren won. Um, we decided first we tried playing north to south because it was just two of us. Um, yeah. we never met each other after a few hours, so then uh, so then we played east to west, and I think she won that one. Yeah. <laughs> I've only played it once and it was like a six player game. I think it was like a pretty full thing. So like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Wow. That's a great, but I'd never even thought about like that whole idea of competition to win the game. Like that's actually really interesting. <laughs> when the wins gets to take this home. Yeah. yeah winner takes all. Um, yeah. yeah. So have you found then um, that as you've worked on more games, you've kind of, played it a few more or it's still kind of something that's mostly just a kind of professional like it's your your work and not really your hobby like um the moment it's just mostly professional because again most of my friends are we're dispersed throughout the country so you don't really get the chance to do like weekly yeah uh, board game meets and that kind of thing Understand. Um, but i have played a few in this uh, this is pre-covid how long ago was that um you know people would get together and like on new year's and we all played games but i think my favorite yeah, yeah. really count was scroll which is, you know, oh, sort of um, uh, the telephone game, but oh which, yes, yeah, oh okay. <laughs> which you I don't think is, that, is Telestration people. sort of similar to that. Uh, might be. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Oh yeah, I just found scroll while googling. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um. So. Is there a game setting or theme? that you would love to do the art for like some kind of world or topic or whatever but so far no one's like you just haven't had the opportunity to do it yeah uh well i always said to this one is uh, farthing wood animals i think should have a game and i would really like to illustrate it that would be good um what is it what? i don't know uh, sorry animals farthing wood was a kids well, book slash tv show in the 90s about a group of animals that have to leave their home because of man are building um stuff on it and they're trying to get to a place called White Deer Park and all these terrible things happened to them on the way and it was like oh no Game of Thrones for kids um <laughs> <laughs> like this butcher bird in one episode that actually spears the mice onto thorns and some hedgehogs get yeah. run over it was like you know like really heart-wrenching when you're little and I just think that yeah, would make yeah. of all these animals and you have to try and get them to White Deer Park and things happen to them on the way that sounds about as traumatic as um what was it Watership Down? Yeah, that's sort of what it gets compared to a lot. Mm. Do, do you working on game projects? Do you ever get the itch to design your own games? Like, is that a, something you've ever thought about doing? Um, only like very vaguely, but not really. Um, I don't think I'd be very good at the game mechanic side of stuff. So yeah. like, ah, oh, this the story would make a good you know game, but someone else then must figure out um the mechanics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. And maybe that's also where the kind of role playing stuff, like it, with you and Katie, kind of maybe because it, it is the story, right? Like a story driven yeah. kind of stuff. So, yeah. So maybe we'll talk about um, Sal a little bit. Um, and I'll bring up the, I'll bring up a website for it. If I can find, go to, yeah. Um, so, you mentioned before, oops, sorry, the wrong button. You mentioned before, sort of, um, that it came out of this, you know, tag team dialogue, whatever you want to call it, with um, with with Katie. Um, how did you actually then go from just this kind of 
you know, story between you two to actually producing a book and, you know, or like the, you know, that kind of stuff. What what kind of well, happened there? Because we had all the documents. I said this whole our whole RP is just on Google Docs. So um and they get very long. So we tend to break them up into threads and go, okay, these cover this particular story and these cover this story. We already sort of had a story arc written. It was just a matter of rewriting it. Um so other people could understand what was going on because like we don't need a lot of exposition and world building because we already know what's happening. Yeah, um, yeah. So in 2017, I think we wrote the first draft, but since we were like new to actually writing books and not just the thing, it was huge. Um, <laughs> like we printed it out for editing. It was like that big. And we figured out actually, no, there should probably be three stories with more of an arc for the characters. Um, so there's a lot of sort of just learning actually what makes a good story versus, you know, what's in the RP that we can understand and enjoy, but probably someone new would have to start at the very beginning, which would yeah. take part of the reading. Um, so then we rewrote the 2017 version, I want to say 2021. Okay. And originally it wasn't going to be illustrated. And then we thought, well, we are artists and it is fun. Because we got two, two um, artists working on it. Yeah, yeah. Because that one thing I don't think we've mentioned before, uh, oh, my internet might be struggling. Sorry if it's not loading. Um, Katie is also an artist uh, and an yeah. illustrator as well. So she's, she's got a number of titles to her name too and some stunning work. Mm. So um, I, oh, I was trying to find it, but maybe I, maybe it's not on your website. I thought I saw somewhere when I was like re doing the research that you, you had a photo of that original like first thick draft. Oh, yeah, I think... Uh, I came up in my Facebook memories. Just uh, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe that's where I saw it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we printed that off. And we're like, oh, yeah, that's good. And then put it aside because of house moves and that kind of thing for a few years. And then yeah. in 2021, I read it again. I was like, oh, actually, uh, yeah, this could do with re rewriting again. So we rewrote it again and cut it into three parts. So we did part one was the Kickstarter, and we're working on the second book uh, now-ish. And I, and I think it's it's available on Amazon Unlimited. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Kindle the, Unlimited, uh, sorry. Yeah, Kindle Unlimited. It's um, well, if you have that, then it's free to read up on there, and it's yeah, got the yeah. got the art in. Very cool. Um, do you want to tell us? I don't know if we've actually really talked about the world. Like, what's what is the world of Solo? What's the story like? You know, um, which is a little intro into the story. Yeah, it's sort of, well, the story, the arc that we picked is sort of, um, I was going to say like prehistory-ish, um, Copper Age sort of kind of people. So earlier than Middle Age folk um, in this mm. big giant um, forest who then, the Southerners who are the ones with the white hair, um, they are slightly more advanced, they're sort of like Egyptian, Roman sail up the coast and they meet them and sort of about how these two people you know get along when they meet mm. with angels and vampires and demons and <laughs> that side of fantasy involved not uh unfortunately we've got no dragons or elves or dwarves um that's why you keep writing more stories yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so angels and demons and stuff one of the main characters is katie's demon called um azel who sort of is the one who causes the most trouble Okay. If you ever see the thing with the, ba the black wolf flying crocodile, um, that's her. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, the world is sort of the main its story is set in this big giant forest um, where they mostly live sort of hunting and gathering, you know, so. Um, I was just trying to look on her website to see if I could find it, yeah. but I, I can't see it quickly, so maybe I'm looking in the wrong spot. I think if um, you scroll yeah. up, you'll turn up. Oh, no, no Azel. I have words with Katie about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so there's, there's like a lot of words which I'm struggling going, uh, how do you describe it? There's a lot of it. Um, <laughs> no, when you're fine. working you've done a great job. Yeah. on a piece for Sol, do you and Katie work on a piece together or is this is a Jackie piece and that's a, a Katie piece? Uh, yeah, it tends to be like, oh, this is a Jackie piece and that's a Katie piece. Okay. Um with any picture I do of Azel, I have to send it to Katie for approval because she's got like a very fixed idea of what she looks like in her head. 
<laughs> yeah, and the first time I drew her, I got the eyes in the wrong place, and she had me redraw them. And so it's sort of that happens, and you'll send each uh, each other's art for feedback and say, well, you know, yeah, what do you think of this? Can we change this or not? Um, but the whole painting of sketching and painting and stuff is done by one person. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Have Have you found that working on your own story has that influenced any of the work that you've done for clients at all? Like since you've been doing that, um. I think it sort of helped in terms of energy almost and that I sort of give myself Fridays to do soul work and then do client work Monday to mm -hmm. Thursday. And mm -hmm. then you sort of don't mind doing, you're sort of like, oh, you know, doing the client work and well, but I know I get to do my own personal stuff on Friday. So you, you know, sort of get more into doing the client work versus yeah. just only doing client work all the time. You then kind of go, I feel I should be doing stuff for myself, but you just never yeah. get around. To it. Mm. Yeah. That's, I understand that feeling. Um, so talking about, so I'm going to talk about client work because why not? That is obviously your main like thing that you professionally do. Some of the games, like I was looking, um, I'm going to bring up my screen again. I saw um, on your website uh, you had like, I particularly like this Red Rising piece, um, which I think might be the box, the main box art. Is that right? Yeah, it's the cover illustration. Yeah, and I just think it's I, I love it. Like it's honestly so beautiful. Um, and then there was another. Oh, it was a different game. I thought there was another Red Rising piece as well that I. I saw think if you somewhere. click on the Red Rising um thingy and then scroll down, scroll it down. might be Hearts. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this. I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. I've, I've I've not played the game. I'm really sorry. But like, um, I really like this. This is the board. It says. And I just think this is also really beautiful. Like I, I really like it. But obviously, this artwork is very different, you know, from like some of the artwork for some of the other games where it's more, um, you know, maybe realistic. Okay, look at this pirates game as an example. Like it's quite different in terms of tone and um, detail and everything. Um, do you find like how do you find working on games that are requiring more simple art compared to ones that are more detailed like do you find that you have to kind of approach them with a different headspace or is it all you just kind of it's all kind of the same for you or um funny enough it's just sort of way I stop in the rendering process uh because I tend to render stuff almost the same way every single time but stuff that's very very painted just gets painted on top of what otherwise would be worthwhile. Um, so you're adding layers of complexity. Yeah. Yeah. And so to keep it simple, you just stop earlier yeah. in the process. Obviously, if it's like a more cartoony face, then that is different yes. to a more realistic face. Um, mm. Yeah. But in games, I tend to sort of, we'll do one or two pieces first to figure out what we want the style to be. Or I ask them to send, um, you know, the clients to send me references. So, well, you know, mm. what style are you looking for? Yep. And just to give me an idea of um, where to aim. Do you have a favourite style? Like if you could just, this particular thing, Forevermore, that's what oh, you'd be doing? Uh, style art tends to be what I like yeah. to do, which is like more realistic, more, slightly more, more realistic, painterly. more painterly, but that takes so long to do. That yeah. if you actually, mm. like, when I was pricing up, like, oh, if I was charging myself for all the style, mm. <laughs> I kind of thought that. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> Like that's the kind of style I enjoy but, doing. But that's a really that's a really useful thing because a part of our so the people that we're um, hoping that this podcast is helpful for are people who are making games and often they're um, smaller publishers or starting out or whatever. Um, I guess that's a good thing to keep in mind is that like the budget can affect the options for what you've got mm. in terms of the art that you're getting done. So if someone approaches you um, and you know and you think that um, what they're wanting is going to be, you know, take a lot of time and therefore be more expensive. How, how do you kind of co um, coach them to <laughs> to maybe understand that they need to change their expectations or something like that? Is is there a, a method that you kind of use? What I would do is sort of, if they weren't sure, you know, what they wanted, um, it's sort of when you do the estimate, go, okay, it's between like, this, this is, I don't know, but like $100 for... Yep. This, um, you know, more simple style and attach an example to two hundred dollars mm. for a more, you know, painterly style, so they can see mm. sort of the scale and go, oh, you can have this or this, you know, yeah. and the aspect is going to change depending on which style we use, mm. um, with how I put it, and then they can sort of decide for themselves. Yeah, what, yeah. Um, a piece like the one that we're looking at at the moment, how long does that take you 
from nothing on the canvas to unfinished? Oh, I'm trying to think. Um, <laughs> I can't remember how long that one in particular took. Be the later portraits mm. from like sketch to being done were about seven or eight hours each, but not in one long yeah. stretch. So I can't work yeah. in long stretch. Yeah, it would hurt my shoulder. Um, yeah. But I was timing myself then. So he was done years ago, so he doesn't count. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was, I, thought there was, I thought there was one on here that had some of the progress shots. shots. Yeah, here we go. So you can see some of the sketches and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's interesting for me to see how you flipped the art. Like, so you went from oh, yeah. it, facing to the left to then facing to the right. Oh, to be honest, yeah. when I'm working, I'll flip the canvas a lot to make sure, you know, things are level because you oh, can yeah. another trick people do is when in Photoshop, which is why that's slightly nicer than normal painting, is you can yeah. flip the canvas all the time. So you could draw a portrait. And then you flip it and suddenly the eyes are like that or the nose is skew and you just mm. don't see when it's facing the other way. So the mm. only problem there is I flip the canvas so often I don't sometimes remember which way, way was the original <laughs> way. But I have had clients come back and go, oh, you know, but it's facing the wrong way now. Can you flip it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, flip the canvas. Oh, that's yeah. funny. Ah, uh, that is funny. Um, and I'm just going to go a bit fangirly on you for a, a second. One of the things that I personally really love about your art is the light that you put in there. So you did the three images for the, the Stella Kickstarter um, and your second one with the, the gunslinger. I absolutely adore that one because of the light that just shines through the scene. Eris, I don't know if you can bring that one up. I'm, I'm going to try and just give me, give me 30 seconds and I will find it. <laughs> It'll be on the uh, Kickstarter page. It's like halfway down, I think. Oh, I've, uh, yep, I was going to bring up the illustration, but you're right, I can go there. That's a good point. Mm. How was was lighting something that you were just ooh, light from a, a really early age or is it like most things that people get really good at, it's just taken years and years and years of practice? I'm not sure on that one. Um, I think I just like, you know, so I like sort of all nice glowy stuff in general mm. um so that's also sort of uh how i tend to paint because um yeah. other um but also the practice makes perfect so i'll save yeah. photos or other artists you there know that I like the look of and sort of study how they do um do things mm. no i adore that piece it's incredibly beautiful i'm looking forward to when my copy gets here it's supposed to be on the way soon I think from the factory um it's just beautiful of the three that you did for the kickstarter did you have a a favorite one that you you know were just this is amazing I love it uh I think um I do like the gunslinger one just because I quite like her face um Mm. I enjoyed the um gumshoe detective because I quite the um the lighting on that was just a lucky fluke I took a reference photo in my bedroom when the light just happened to be like that on the little mannequin I was using mm. so it's really cool you know from the um the windows because I've got yeah the paint um it just happened to be like it in the photo reference I had and I just liked the um the way the photo turned out so mm. um, it's so effective it's so effective because obviously like it does help the character just pop like you've got that that's the, mm. that contrast of the light on the character's back but then the the shadow kind of behind them yeah it's really but it also it gives so much to the scene it gives it that that dark investigation you know hunting for something feel because it feels maybe like you're not seeing the whole picture and there's little details obscured in the shadows yeah so i'm quite fond of that one because that was just sort of when you do find because i take um photos for reference sometimes mm-hmm. and when you manage to get a really good reference like oh that's just you know a really lucky um shot that's really cool mm. and, and then of course the third one is the omni gamer um yeah i quite like we it had a, when we went live when we launched the campaign last week we actually had a moment where all of us on the the live stream that we did we we're all looking at it and we we're all hang on what are those things we were like, oh, there's, you know, there's the paper rock and there's the dice and there's the space invaders and we were looking at the Monopoly board and it took ages for us to all go, oh, it's it's Monopoly. 
Because one yeah. of the jokes with board games is it's not just Monopoly. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I was like, what, what board game would most people recognise sort of as a, you know, adequate mm. glance? Well, man, I know the joke is like, it's not Monopoly game or yeah. not Cluedo. It's like, <laughs> not Monopoly and then, you know. <laughs> so. No, it was I just like so it. perfect. It was really, really perfect. But also, but also I think it, it it's actually in some ways good that we didn't necessarily realise it was Monopoly because I think you've made mm. enough changes to make it still this kind of like, it could be, it could not be. Like, what is it? Like, I, I think for me, because I had the three dice, I just didn't even think. <laughs> I just thought, oh, yeah, three dice. That's what a game. I don't know what game that is. That's interesting. Like, yeah, yeah and I've just spotted it. I was just going to say, I wasn't trying to go on copyright. So I was like, I can't make you know, it too obvious it's yeah. Monopoly or maybe mm, not. Course. So let's yeah. just you know, hint to that it's some kind of ball game. But, Fair enough. Yeah. And, and wise um yeah really cool and the colors are beautiful like and everything i guess okay so this is my little selfish question because we've had some again some slight debate about interpreting the character mm-hmm. i read the character as having two arms that are kind of like moving quickly between all these different things some other people have felt that maybe it's like they're kind of like holograms or spiritual projections or something do you do you have the Jackie Davis official you know version of of what this is, or would you rather not like tell us and let us all just? Oh, I don't want to break it up. I kind of thought they were like hologrammy. Oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they obviously do look like that too, but I think in my head, I just like this idea of them like whoo, like moving really oh, fast and I keeping like track of all this. Um, I didn't want to add any like motion blur or something because I knew they were going to be printed. I didn't want people going, mm. oh printed very well um, yeah, it's like hey it's this thing's blurry what's going on yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that's something interesting to talk about so obviously your training your background was in things that are going to be animated mm-hmm. um i would imagine there wasn't an awful lot of you need to think about printing and manufacturing when you're doing that training but obviously board games it's all about manufacturing and printing the end result what what impact did that have for how you execute your art, how you carry it out, or the, even the way that you, you draw it, you put it together? Has it made any difference? Um, actually, I think it's helped quite a bit because in, um, especially in 2D animation, you know, you draw the character, for example, you would animate that on a blank piece of paper. And with the mm. background, you superimpose it on later. So everything has to be in layers and you have to finish the background layers behind the character. You can't have half a tree even if the character's right. covering up the front half. So mm. sort of sometimes, um, you know, in board game art, you obviously have to ask um, if the client wants everything finished behind them so the graphic designer can then move people about. Mm. Yeah, you know that, uh, well, I need to finish. Yeah. This layer so what you're the- saying is we shouldn't go digging around in the layers on your PSDs yeah. because there might be half a tree. Yeah, some, yeah there's half a tree. No, I think, I think we're saying that with Kate, with uh, Jackie's work, we can do that because she's doing all the background stuff, mate. Like, uh, if, it's, you know, if they're then. paying for it, if they're paying for it. <laughs> ask beforehand, like you can't suddenly yeah. half of and go, we, especially if it's realistic painting because obviously yeah. shadows affect what's going on behind. Yeah. So of if you course. have a realistic painting and then move this character and there's still a shadow on a tree, that would be a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So no, you were point. telling us that your mum basically refused to draw you a horse because you were like, no, that looks wrong, do it again. Yeah. Um, how are your horses now? Are you good at drawing horses these days? I enjoy drawing horses. There's a couple in um, uh, the soul book and there's Ooh, a... I know. The pale horse is very beautiful. And, very um, beautiful. Oh, yeah, he took forever. And the, the, the boy on the zebra, because that was my sort of pitch. Uh, Katie and I are arguing about what animals southerners should ride. And I just think riding zebras looks cool. I know you can't domesticate them in real life. Mm. So I did that painting to sort of go, but look how cool it would look. Um, so, yeah, that's the one. Um, What's the hardest thing for you to draw? Things people go, hey, I need you to do a uh, well, insert thing, and you go, oh, really? Well, they're not in my portfolio for that reason. And that's like uh, mechanical stuff, so robots or spaceships, yep. cars, or like anything mechanical um, or too architectural. Uh, yeah. But I think I think that's a good that's a good segue or like like thing into the fact that if a client like if I'm producing a game and I'm hiring an artist, 
you yeah. can't expect everyone to be good at like literally every single thing. Like people have skills and specialties in, in some stuff. And yeah, I think it's good to, and that's also probably one, another reason why sometimes you do hire more than one artist f- yeah. for a project because you're getting those specialties. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Um, for anyone interested in any of the soul art, um, Jackie is, is one of our artists on the Stella Prince store, which is stellaprince.store, and I've got a link that I can bring up. So if anyone is interested in purchasing or looking in more detail about some of these um, artworks, you can go to uh, stellaprince.store slash collections slash Jackie hyphen Dave, uh, Davis. Um, and it's J-A-C-Q-U-I because I know I did get Jackie wrong one time when I was trying to write your name. Sorry, Jackie, <laughs> I got the wrong spelling. Um and yeah, so we can see this is the work that um Kate referenced before called the pale horse. If my internet's gonna loading, load, there we go. Loading, there we go. Yeah. Um can I zoom in? Oh, not really. My um browser's not playing nice. Yeah, uh if you cool. click it, I think you'll get a larger version. Oh, yeah. Hello. Who would have thought that such such simple technologies <laughs> existed, those clicking on things? Oh. Um yeah, so these are like yeah, beautiful um, artworks. And if anyone's interested, then, yeah, go check them out. Well, I've got um, one. I think I've got a pale horse one um, that you guys I think that was one of the ones that I organised, yeah. Oh, cool. How, yeah. And does it does it come up like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is a loaded question, obviously, but does it come up nice when it's like on the yeah, print I, on the metal? Because um, it's got a, obviously it's metal, so it's got that metallic sheen. So, so it looks, it makes the horses, um, you know, the white horse look nice and sort of, almost metallic yeah. um, and there's actually a breed yeah. of metallic isn't there um so that looks very cool yeah very cool um oh, let's see if i can go back to no that. which is your favorite piece from soul do you have a favorite or is it a bit like children you can't officially have a favorite i think i'd have to say it's just probably the cover because that's done the most work for us is yeah. um yeah so that guy the yellow one mm. um the most comments we get on the book is just, oh, you know, the cover's really nice. <laughs> mm. um, I mean, but but to be fair, it is really nice. Like, it's a lovely image. Like, it's beautiful. So, yeah, yeah. it's captivating. But the trick is I have to do book two's cover now as well. And you're like, ah, oh, how are we going <laughs> to um, keep it similar to that one? that sort of match it i mean so, c- could you in theory just hand all that problem to katie and say hey you're doing book two's cover uh, or she's just uh-huh. had a baby like three weeks uh-huh. ago so probably not fair, <laughs> enough. <laughs> fair enough um i hadn't really noticed until looking at this print just then but how the characters are coming like the silhouettes of characters underneath the hand like next to the title underneath the hands in the water yeah interesting so interesting there's so much stuff even though like it's not a super complicated yeah, image. There's still stuff that I only notice on repeat viewings. Yeah, Isn't that beautiful. Cool? Um, I think that's one right, of the well, lovely things about art is discovering new things that you hadn't noticed last yeah. time you looked. Oh yeah, and a lot of the um, more complicated cell pictures, I was putting in lots of details, and like, well, only I would really care. But like, <laughs> oh, if you read the book, then you'll and you come back and look at it, then then people might pick up on stuff. Mm. That they wouldn't when they just look at it without you know any of the context mm. yeah we're adding those little um details in hands as well Beautiful. your hands are obviously hands like hands and faces are things that a lot of artists struggle with well, was um, that one thing that you just practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced uh yeah sort of um so it helped me draw hands a lot was looking at um Milk Carl's uh, character designs. He's the guy who designed, he's one of the Disney anim- old original Dis- Disney animators, and he designed uh, Merlin, for example, from Sword in the Stone. And if you look okay. at their hands, they're really simple, sort of quite blocky, but he just did hands yeah. really well. So, sort of, um, when I was doing animation in uni, looked at his artwork a lot. We got mm, used to do yeah. him. But after having simplified the hands, you sort of get a basic idea of you know, the structure, then it's slightly easier then to do more realistic ones because you sort of know mm. how to construct them underneath. And that one was just my, you know, photo I had to take, you know, huh. reference of my hand. So a lot of yep. my cats have very long spindly fingers because I do and I'm the one taking the photo. <laughs> 
I, I'm in so in awe of people that do art like of realistic things because it's like I just can't do it. And um, yeah, hands and faces, like Kate said, it's just it's phenomenal. And this mm. work is really beautiful. Um, how can people keep it up to date with you, Jackie? Um, so mostly on Twitter, which is at Logic Fairy, and um, on Facebook, which is Jackie Davis Art, and or Instagram, which is also at Logic Fairy. Um, and I tend to just cross post stuff a lot. So if you've seen it on one of those platforms, it'll probably have been on the other one. Um, yep. And I'm most active mm-hmm. on Twitter, really. Um, just, and, you, and obviously you know. there is some work on your oh, yeah. actual, actual work. And on the Sol one, we have a newsletter, but that's just mostly for Sol book news. Yep. Yep. I need to just update my own website and add a newsletter on at some point, but that's admin I need to get around to. Yep. So what's next for Jackie Davis that isn't under an NDA and that you can tell us about? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm supposed to be starting really, um, but again, an NDA, so that'll be mm-hmm. that's in the future. So we'll just, we're going to put a beep in there yeah. so that you can pretend you told us what they were and we just redacted it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hey, uh, you're expecting some advanced video editing skills, Kate, that I'm not sure I've quite got yet. <laughs> um, so dinosaurs, as in when I feel like doing my dinos, and um, then uh, just sell. We're, I'm busy writing book two of Sol at the moment, mm-hmm. and then want to do the art for that and kickstart that either next year or the year after. Yep. I don't want to kickstart something that's not done because that's just going to be more stress than it's worth. So I want yes. to finish yes. the I highly recommend that you get it to like 95% done and then kickstart that puppy. Yeah. So uh, yeah. that's what we're doing. And I'd like, cool. to, I'd like to do a portrait sort of, did either of you ever watch The Last Kingdom? It's about uh, Vikings and King Alfred and that lot. Yes, I, I think I did. It sounds um, familiar, but I couldn't actually tell you much about it. Well, um, I would quite like to do sort of like, a red wall take on King Alfred and that. So sort of little anthropomorphic animals, but all about, you know, when the Vikings you know, invaded England, I think it would be quite cute to do a few little paintings of that. But it's all about uh, timing and free time and that kind of thing. Is it based on some novels by Bernard uh, Cornwell? Yeah. Or is it a different one? I uh, know it's that guy, Bernard Cornwell. It is. But, I mean, it's a real period of history about in um, – the Vikings almost took over England, and then King Alfred was the only one that stopped them. So we almost yeah. had the Danish uh, England. Yeah. Hmm. Still, quite a lot of that um, Scandinavian blood running around the, the kingdom. Oh yeah, North and look all the um, place names. Yeah, the North have Danish roots. There's a there's a YouTube um, channel called Map Men. And I'm pretty certain they've done an episode on like UK name because like, mm. because the names are weird right for a lot of things and pronunciations and stuff. But something that they pointed out was based on the place names, you can almost see where the different yeah, settlers like, came like, and where they stopped. Yeah, like it's it's such it's even now like mm. however many hundreds of years later, like it, or thousands of years later, it's like so mm. it's still like there in the landscape. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, my yeah. um my dad's mother, her maiden name was Scully, and they can trace that back to the Viking invaders from um, the Battle of Normandy when yeah. William the Conqueror was doing his thing down there up north. The, the Vikings were having a go in 1066, and mm-hmm. Scully was one of the the relatives of the Danish king who tried to invade, and that oh. became Scully. Yeah, like my parents live in a place called Kirby, which is just means church place. So any name that ends in B just means place or hill. I think. Or has a kirk in it means church, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Well, there you go. This has turned into a historical fact yeah. knowledge yeah. podcast. Up with Kate and Jackie. So yeah. I, I might wrap it up and do my farewells and, and sign off stuff. So uh, thank you very much, Jackie, for your time. Really much appreciated. And it was really interesting yeah. hearing about soul and the other things. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Um, thank you, Kate, again, for your time. Much appreciated. Welcome. And I, I know you've had a hectic few days so it's nice yeah. that you could spend the time with us here sorry now the cat's screaming <laughs> no worries um 
All right. So thank you uh, for anyone who's watched us on, on YouTube or anywhere else. Much appreciated. Uh, Materialize is produced by Launch Tabletop. If you want to head to launchtabletop.com, you can check out what we're doing. Um, one of the things that we do is Launch Lab, which is our print on demand game making service. And if you use the code Materialize at checkout, you can get 20% off your next order. But it's completely free just to create an account and explore and put together some ideas and see what you can do. Um, and you can also check out stellarprints.store for these metal prints. And obviously, we've talked about the beautiful ones that Jackie has got up, up there already. So please investigate them. Um, and I think that's everything. So thank you both again. And I'm going to play the closing music. So farewell. Farewell.